know what I mean? Welcome to Ernest Roulette, the only Ernest podcast with a wheel. Give it a spin, Neil. I was gonna. Ernest rides again. Ernest rides again. We are now in the post Disney era of the Ernest filmography, but technically pre uh, direct to video. Technically, this is a weird movie. This movie came out in 1993, which is what, two calendar years after mm -hmm. Ernest Scared Stupid? Yep. So apparently, Ernest Scared Stupid comes out and it is somewhat profitable, probably made good money in home video, but Disney was not happy with it. The Ernest mm. profit margins were on a decline. <laughs> Jail made a little less money, a little less profit than yeah. Christmas. And then Scared Stupid, despite all their efforts to make it more marketable towards kids and the seasonal film, just wasn't bringing in the money. Disney cut their ties. Yep, they signed a four film contract. And when four films are up, they looked at what they had and said, no, thanks. That's why they said four. The result is Ernest Rides Again. Yep. Ernest Rise Again is directed by John Cherry, but yes, is the first post-Disney, post-Touchstone Ernest film. And it feels like a comeback because it's literally called Ernest Rides Again. It's as if Ernest is back. Ernest P. Worrell is this time a janitor at a college in either Virginia, West Virginia, North Carolina, somewhere in the American East Coast. Well, let's pull up the Ernest map yes. because the one thing we do know about this movie by virtue of Jim Varney wearing a long sleeve shirt because it's cold out, is that it was shot in Canada. Yes. Is it, is it Vancouver? Probably, yeah. Probably Vancouver. <laughs> Although Jim Varney and John Cherry and all those good folks are Tennessee natives, this was the first one filmed in Canada. This movie was- But wait, hang on. It does not take place in Canada. No. I think the, I think the Ernest map has to reflect the intended location, does it not? You're going to make me do this. You're going to make me edit this. They've shot most of the other films, aside from Florida, they just shot them in Tennessee. But so, they're not all in Tennessee. Do they specifically say it's Virginia? I believe they do. I didn't even know that he was confirmed as a janitor. Right. I, I think it's worth saying even this early on, we, we tried twice to watch this movie. Yeah. Over a year ago, we were together, we threw on Ernest Rides Again because none of us had seen it. We yeah. said, oh cool, let's watch the next Ernest movie. And we couldn't finish it. So coming back to it in 2018, um, just on the whole, what, what did everyone think of it? It made me sad. And <laughs> it made me sad yeah. because it seems like a product made by people trying to come back. Ernest rides again. He's not done yet. He's in for, he's not just like one last hurrah. He never rides off into the sunset at the end. Ernest is back and he's here to stay. Yeah. There are more Ernest films coming, but th yes. this, I, I, I feel like they thought we don't need Disney. We can make this happen. It was a theatrical exactly. release. It came out in some theaters mm -hmm. for like a weekend. Yeah. I guess it was a disaster. <laughs> this came out about a month after the Simpsons episode that makes the joke, Ernest goes somewhere cheap. Wow, public library. We'll stay here for a while, Vern. If you don't mind, we're trying to watch the movie. Hey, Vern, help me get my head out of this toilet. <laughs> it's the Cape Fear episode. I looked this up. Classic episode. And that joke makes a lot more sense after you've seen this movie. Yeah. If you told me that this was a treatment that they came up with between Ernest Goes to Camp and Ernest Saves Christmas, I'd buy that. Yeah. And I think the movie would work a lot better in that period. The stakes of it are kind of in between there. And it's kind of, it feels like an Ernest movie they would have made when they didn't realize Ernest could be helping Santa Claus and fighting trolls and stuff, you know? Ryan mentioned a moment ago how this movie makes him kind of sad, and I, I share that sadness, because when I look at this movie, I see John Cherry, Coke Sam's, Jim Varney, and the rest of the Ernest Partners Limited. I think that's the name of their company yep. by this stage <laughs> in the game, because they no longer have Touchstone. Um, I, I see them trying to make Ernest less annoying. I see Jim Varney making, I think they're improv jokes. The self-aware gags. Ah! Oh. Ernest, are you dead? Oh, oh. oh, I guess I would be if I weren't just that close to being an actual cartoon. Oh. Funny jokes. And when you watch the trailer, you get a bit excited because you think, oh, this might be a smarter or a wittier movie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, jump, Dr. Mellon, jump. No, no, to the cannon, to the cannon. The ingredients just don't 
quite come together. They don't. I think, uh, well, I think it was definitely a conscious choice of we don't have as much money and we don't know how to spend it as efficiently as we would have with with Disney's resources. Yes. So uh, they consciously made a movie that they could make cheaper and that relies on dialogue a lot more. And the movies have always had fun dialogue, Jim Varney saying goofy stuff, but this has a lot more back and forth banter. It's more of a buddy comedy. Yeah. There's other characters that also talk a lot. We're getting ahead of ourselves on the specifics. Yeah, right? we do you should, wanna, uh, like, let's, do you wanna... like, let's get the plot. Let's, uh, you, you said you earlier, you could probably sum it up in about a hundred seconds, right? <laughs> and I will. <laughs> All right, go for it. What happens in Ernest Rides Again? In Ernest Rides Again, Ernest P. Worrell, uh, is a janitor or some sort of handyman. He actually, you're right, his exact job is never specified at a local college. And he's friends with this Rick Moranis type of professor who uh, pitches his idea, his theory, that there was another group, a secret group of American Revolutionary soldiers, the 314th, which is acute, pi, 3.14, the oh. 314th, and that they stole the crown jewels which were brought over to America, and that the crown jewels are actually, the ones in England are fake, the real crown jewels are in a giant cannon hidden in the hills called Goliath. So Ernest and uh, his, his nerd professor buddy, Abner. Abner. They, Abner. they say Abner, but Abnor Mellon is, is actually a funnier yeah. joke. Yeah, there you go. Look at that missed opportunity. <laughs> Dr. Mellon is what I... The name, Dr. Mellon. The yeah. names in these movies, man. All right, yeah. <laughs> Ernest and Dr. Mellon go out looking. Ernest finds a clue, brings the Dr. Mellon, confirms his theory. They find, uh, close to where they've been looking before, where he found the clue, the big cannon Goliath. Now, I we talked about the budget of this movie and not knowing how to spend the money. Mm -hmm. Ryan, where, where do they find this wonderful clue? A shack. Wow. Behind where they've been working at a construction site. <laughs> it's literally there's it's a it's a construct it's not even a two story building mine shaft. they're building. It's just it's just some wood. It's like a house. Some guy's building a house. Yep, it's, it's a real construction site. Ernest going somewhere cheap. Uh, the movie opens in this location. It's Ernest. For some reason he's kind of uh doing make believe. He's playing pretend on his own. It's a weird button to like start the character on, I think. Yeah. Uh because you're kinda like how aware of reality is this person? Dr. Mellon and Ernest are being pursued by the bad guys, Dr. Glencliff, and some, and turns out there's actually several other people in sort of a, it's a mad, mad, mad world, trying to get the crown jewels from the giant cannon. The giant cannon rolls off of its foundation, starts running, and most of the movie is a bunch of people chasing the cannon. Eventually, the cannon stops. Uh, they find out the crown jewels are actually inside of it. And they have to get the crown jewel, the actual crown, off of Ernest's head. And in the end, the bad guy's defeated. Dr. Mellon's theory is confirmed. The crown jewels they don't get to keep. And Ernest uh, makes a good friend. So this movie is one hour, 39 minutes, 29 seconds. That's 20 minutes longer than Ernest goes to jail. This movie's padding is absurd. Yeah. The movie opens on a Mr. Bill cartoon. Do you guys remember Mr. Bill? Oh yeah, yes, actually. I do. Funny you should mention Mr. Bill. Ladies and gentlemen, for the first time ever on Ernest Roulette, Mr. Bill. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, guys. You know, it's great to be here at Jurassic Sound and Light to talk about Ernest. Uh, but you know, being in this movie was one of my greatest achievements. Mr. Bill, thank you so much for being with us today at Jurassic Sound and Light. May I offer you some coffee? I'm actually working on a screenplay for the Mr. Bill reboot right now. I've been talking with the- Oh no! <coughs> so Kevin, you were talking about padding. This movie has a Mr. Bill short that opens it, which leads into this amazing opening title sequence, which we'll get to. And the credits kick in at 1 hour, 35 minutes, 35 seconds. I did some basic math and I realized that 12% of this movie, more than 12% of this movie is material that has nothing to do with the actual movie itself. Like that's, that's crazy. So what are you including? You're including the Mr. Bill, the credits. Yep. And yeah, Mr. Bill and the credits, like 12%. Oh, uh, you could argue more of that for sure. It's like, it's, it's crazy. There's like a, so much of this movie has nothing. Like, I think they got the first cut of the movie in. And they looked at what they had, and I think they knew, like, oh, none of this works. It's a little more verbose and, like, uh, like you mentioned, like, plucky. Like, the, the humor is a little more, uh, it's a little less dependent on pratfall jokes, a little less childish. It's bickering back and forth, yeah. Those kind of movies are obviously capable of being good, mm -hmm. but 
it, it doesn't commit hard enough to that lane. There's just some no. we it's the tones all over the place. So I think they knew they had a stinker and they just padded this movie with the Mr. Bill skit and probably the best song in the whole series. Right. I think we're all in agreement. Yeah. Like the, I, the intro credits set you up so much in this movie. They're so much better than the rest of the movie. And they're honestly better than most of the most of the other intro credits. I mean, we like the other intro credits to oh, yeah, one way or is, another, but this, but this is, is so good. There once was a man named Warhol. Heard as he Warhol. It's a great song. Even as a lamb, he was sensitive and caring. As cunning as a fox and as slippery as a hairy. This song has got really fun, clever rhymes in it. It builds to a beautiful crescendo. And uh, it's got a pretty, pretty good kind of like Monty Python style cutout yeah. images yeah. of Ernest's face in various historical um, like wood car- uh, wood cutting. And they're wood not cutting. setting some weird example that he's like Van Helsing's that he's like <laughs> been history through history or like the Assassin's Creed. <laughs> no, none of that. Like, oh, there were whorls in ancient Egypt. There were whorls in the Byzantine Empire. There were whorls. No, none of that matters. Yeah. Oh, he, this is a storied guy, this Ernest P. Whorl. And, you know, they're, they're telling stories about how you could Learneth from Ernest, and how Ernest. <laughs> my favorite rhyme, yeah. And how Ernest sends his mother money every week. <laughs> he calls her every Sunday. He's a good guy, mm-hmm. but man, the rest of this movie can't keep up. And I don't. I, let we we keep dumping on it. What what about this movie worked for you guys? Were there any highlights? Any jokes? What I I, I tried to explain it earlier. How if this movie had come out at a different time, I'd probably like it a little better. I'd be a little more charitable towards it. Yeah. Uh, before. The high heights of Ernest Saves Christmas, Ernest Goes to Jail, the, and Ernest Scared Stupid, these really high concept situations that Ernest gets put in. It feels weird to go back to kind of a uh, homespun backyard adventure, you know? The previous Ernest films have genres assigned to them, and that's like the fun of them, right? Yep. Like a Christmas movie, mm-hmm. a camp movie. What is the genre here? If it's supposed to be action adventure, because he talks about Indiana Jones I think that's and action it. adventure films a lot, I wonder if an earlier version of the script had cutaways to his imagination, like Doug Funny style, yeah. where we see him dressed as Indiana Jones. We see him doing the Indiana Jones, taking the thing off, like uh, like Weird Al Yankovic succeeds in doing in uh, UHF. Yeah. That we see Ernest in his own mind or dress up as a character. Instead, he's just talking to usually himself, occasionally us, the audience, and playing pretend. While we're on the subject of Ernest playing pretend... <laughs> They try to continue the gag from Scared Stupid, where Ernest just pops into different characters in front of people, which was already, I think, a little flat in Ernest Scared Stupid. It was probably the weakest but biggest joke in that movie. They call back to it during the finale, even. They do it out of the gate, and Ernest rides again. They don't give Jim Varney any costumes. There's no lighting changes. There's there's like no dramatic lighting in this movie. It's a very flat, boring, gray movie. Mm -hmm. You talked about saving money. They probably figured, just shoot during the day when it's cloudy out. And the secret treasure of Nefertiti lies just in our grass. Uh-uh. Don't want to be taking nothing from no Nefertiti. She might in particular about that jewelry. A Nefertiti? Yeah, I remember Nefertiti. She used to drive a 36 Chrysler. It just looks so low budget to the point that it's a bit of a, it's a bummer to watch it happen. Mm-hmm. And you're just watching Jim Varney go into characters, which is kind of funny, but the camera doesn't even stay in the exact same position. So you have like a cool jump cut. It doesn't change dramatically enough that it looks like an intentional effect. The camera just kind of like wiggles around between cuts. It's like a bad special effect in a way. It's just it looks so, kind of like they said like Jim, go crazy, and I think it's exactly. And they cut out all the parts where he like put his head down, and be like, oh, okay, if I, I have a I have a British accent. <laughs> and he did. It, yeah. Jim does his job, and that's what makes this so sad for me is that they, yeah, John Cherry and and Jim Varney and friends went. We don't need their big Disney money. We don't need their big Touchstone production. Jim Varney's character Ernest is funny enough on his own to hold the movie. You can just roll the camera in front of him and he's the next Buster Keaton. They ask him to do like goofy stuff and like the rest of the movie just doesn't hold its weight. Like he's just doing that gag at the beginning in front of some trees. And it, you know what it reminds me of? I think this movie's overrated. Split. We, we've, all, we've seen Split. You haven't seen Split. Everyone I talk to agrees that Split is kind of a whatever movie in most regards. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, but James McAvoy, mm-hmm. who I actually really like, James McAvoy does those multiple personality changes 
in front of you. Like you just start to acting like somebody else. And it's so impressive. And they do these like hard cuts sometimes. I'm Mary Reynolds. Por favor, senora. We almost got you, bro. Does he have an Auntie Nelda? Yes, he basically does. <laughs> he does. He listens to me. Split is not a good movie. <laughs> It's not a good movie. Split is just the opening of Ernest Rides again for like a hundred minutes with a cool twist that ties into a great film that's probably going to make that great film worse. Maybe Shyamalan up in Philly used to just love Ernest. I don't know, man. <laughs> he probably did. He would have been age appropriate. I just wanted to get that off my chest. Yeah. Now, to go back to <laughs> what we were talking about, as an action adventure film, I can totally see that they probably imagined this as being more far reaching, far traveling, like they, they're a long way from home by the end. And then the, the product they ended up with, it really feels like they're just kind of going in a circle around the house. I mentioned this earlier when we were finishing up the movie, around an hour and 11 minutes in, mm -hmm. I wrote down time code for this, that this there's this cannon chase in the movie that lasts like- Most of the movie. It lasts over half an hour. It's like Fury Road with Ernest. It's like, it's half an hour of the movie, which I think conceptually is funny, that Ernest is just stuck on this old- civil Gigantic cannon. It, well, nothing can stop the Goliath. They is spent all stops. the money on this cannon. Is it problem. from the Revolutionary War? Yes. Okay, yeah. Like the, the like you, Yeah, they spend a lot of their money and time, the, the budget of time on this cannon. And conceptually, yeah, half an hour of the movie, Ernest is stuck on a cannon, screaming, mm -hmm. screaming, screaming. <laughs> When that ends, I think we're supposed to feel like they've gone across like a time zone because they're like spending the night in a barn, him and his, uh, his and Dr. Mellon, or they're boiling corn in a can. Yeah, that scene felt like something out of the the Big Bird movie. Like, right. oh, oh, we're like, oh, we were a long way from home. It's like, I'm pretty sure you're like three blocks away from where yeah. you started. <laughs> One other reason this movie doesn't feel that epic or grand in scale is that the aspect ratio feels off. I think this is an open mat film. Do you guys know what an open mat is? It's when they intend it to be screened as a widescreen picture. Yep. But they film it with the top and the bottom, a little bit extra if they make sure they don't put anything important up and down. Mm -hmm. Then when they release it on video, instead of cropping the sides off to make it a square, they just open up those part, those extra parts that were not shown on on the screen. Exactly. And J James Cameron was an expert at this. You look at Terminator 2. That's why when people watch Terminator 2 on home video, no one complained about black bars or like pan and scan because Cameron actually shot that movie with four by three in mind. Mm -hmm. This movie was supposed to be a big theatrical return for Ernest after two years. I think it was two years. And an excruciatingly long time to go without an Ernest film. After. Yeah, 24 months. Yeah. <laughs> There's so much headroom in this movie, there are so many scenes where there's just a bunch of vacant space above the actors. It just doesn't feel like a piece of cinema anymore. There's no way it was like CinemaScope or like 2.35 to one. Did you guys pick up on that at all? Like just the compositions? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I absolutely did. So nitpicky, I know. <laughs> but like it bothered me. No, but it's relevant because, especially because this is their last theatrical release. That yeah. this did get in theaters for, you know, as long as it takes you to watch the movie. Yeah. Once. Yeah. I think the genre they were going for was a action chase movie. Uh, everyone's going after the same treasure. And unless you have like the budget and like the the pacing uh, skill and technique of someone like James Cameron or George Miller or whatever, the problems with this movie aren't necessarily failings as an earnest movie. I think it's just what they were going for with the resources they had just is not satisfying. I think they were trying to like course correct him out of being annoying. I think in this movie, Ernest ends up being kind of annoying to me for the first time ever mm -hmm. because he's just screaming a bunch. Varney's not giving a lot to do for like 20, 30 minutes at a time. And Dr. Mellon is pretty annoying too. All the actors in this movie, although they're often playing annoying characters, but they're all pretty competent, right? Dr. Mellon would be better suited as the Rick Moranis type nerdy professor who gains confidence through his time with freewheeling reckless Ernest. He should never crack jokes, and he cracks a lot. He's he does, not funny. Yeah. It's funny when he's scared of things, because sure. he should be a little, he's a wuss until he's not. And it's great that he has some buildup, but then the buildup comes and goes. They give us a little confidence, they take it away. They say like, oh, he's scared of his wife. She's bigger and taller 
and they don't even play into gender tropes all that much. Most of the movies dress like she's gonna fight someone. She's kind of, she she's fights. supposed to be kind of like the hen pecking wife who uh yeah. It's yeah. a bad trope, it's a, but that's that's where they come but, from. But it's but an old cliche. But yeah. they don't even commit to the hen pecking stuff with her. Like no. they, like no, it's, it's kind of spoken. Yeah. They they tell well, you that it's happening, but when you watch her on screen, she's kinda of too likable. I didn't catch your name, but she's been in a lot of stuff. Linda she's Cash. Been, Linda Cash. Linda she's Cash in, is in several Ernest movies. Yes. Yep. And I really liked her a lot in this movie. I think, yeah, exactly. She ends up being too likable to really dislike. She gets paired off with the salesman duo. The Chuck and yeah. Bobby replacements. Yeah, let's throw up the uh, Chuck and Bobby chart. <laughs> I'll make it later, don't worry, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> they just can't get it right. They keep losing actors. Yeah. <laughs> or something. This one doesn't even have Bobby in it. These fucking salesmen, though, they're like... They sell vacuum cleaners. Uh, and other stuff. They sell guns, too, apparently. Like a catalog of stuff. Um, they're, they're, as performers, they're fine, right? They, Here's the problem. They're do, you're absolutely right. They're as rehearsed. Performers, they have good mm -hmm. faces for the roles. They are doing their job, and their job isn't funny. Ma'am, we are just so terribly pleased to be able to offer you the amazing Mighty Workboy Vacuum Cleaner. For only $22. And 75 cents. $22. And, and 75 cents. The thing I dislike about them the most are their faces. But the thing I also dislike about the thing <laughs> so actually that I dislike about their behavior is that they have a lot of they're kind of presumptuous for an earnest film, and I didn't think that was possible. And by presumptuous, I mean they assume they act as though we already know who they are. Mm. They have a conduct amount, they finish each other's sentences, they have a really specific one, two, three timing to them. Yeah, it's like yeah. they're local celebrities in a town that you didn't grow up in, or yeah. they're in Canada that we've never seen them before. Like a weather. I think that man. is the case. Right? I think you're absolutely right. These aren't normal people. People no. don't talk like this. And maybe the gag is supposed to be, oh, salesmen are like so coordinated and pitchmen like they would talk like this. But I mean, would kids find that funny? I didn't. Yeah, I mean, we're adults. I also yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> they never actually interact with Ernest. No, Their they do roles, save him at the end, right? Yes, there's well, at the very end, they're using their vacuum cleaner to blow the air out of suck away. The villain, <laughs> they're right? They're trying to suck away Dr. Glencliff. And Ernest, with the crown still, with the crown still on his head, <laughs> <laughs> runs away behind a door. Ernest and them are never in a scene together. Yeah. And their function of helping uh, Dr. Mellon's Mrs. Mellon could be done by a, a, a lot of other factors, a lot of other sure. characters and things. But when they do meet the villain, he clearly is annoyed by them, yeah. and he punches them both with one punch, yeah. which made me laugh. I am writing work, boy! I am writing <laughs> it was good. Uh, and actually, uh, the villain kind of won me over at the end when he is trying to shoot Ernest in his uh, in his office, like full a blunderbuss or something. Yeah, with yeah, with this antique gun, <laughs> like and they're destroying bullets, all of these props that he's like spent a fortune on, apparently. And he's just laughing like a maniac. And I was like, okay, this is fun. You can just I, the filmmakers know that breaking a lot of stuff is entertaining for a few minutes, and they they, they go for that. I think it would have been funnier if he was more angry than crazy in that moment. Like, sure. just trying to kill Ernest, like, going nuts. And getting pissed off that all his stuff was breaking, maybe? I, I don't know who the director of photography of this movie was. They probably didn't have much time. This movie just doesn't have a lot of fun things to look at. And the few times they're, they explore, like, a crazy wide lens, like, borderline fisheye stuff, mm -hmm. it just feels weird. Like, coming off of how nice-looking Scared Stupid is, I know it's an unfair metric. They had way more money, and they shot a lot of that on sound stages. But man, like there, there are scenes where they're just talking on steps to each other, Mellon and Ernest, and Varney's face is just like boom across the lens when he turns his face because the lens is so wide and just shoved in his face. And it's it, not slick at all. It's just, yeah. It feels lazy. It, yeah. It just feels like, all right, this will make it look funny. The she, villains are terrible. Yeah, they're. They feel like ripoffs of the Ernest Goes to Camp bad guys. That's exactly what I was mm -hmm. thinking. Like they couldn't afford to do the Ernest Goes to Camp caliber villainy. It like they, they what's so what's the bad guy? You mentioned his name earlier, Doctor Glencliff. I'm Doctor Radner Glencliff, who's an actual practicing physician in this film. He heals the <laughs> sick and wounded in the hospital, and he's a bastard. He has a lot of uh, antiquities in his office. He likes money. It's the only real set in the movie is his office, right? Yeah. He's going to like saw off Ernest's head to get the jewels. There's two different yeah. times where they're like, just cut Ernest out of something. <laughs> it's kind of a running joke that they're going to like dice Ernest up. No one's going to miss him. <laughs> um, I got one more joke from the movie I enjoyed. It's when Ernest and Melon steal a tractor because they need, they need a car, basically. Yeah, your country life ain't like your city environs. And the folk out here, 
They have their way of, well, lending a fellow citizen a helping hand. Like that Farmer John guy, lending us his tractor. And why is he following us? Oh, exercise, I suppose. Tractor nappers! I liked the joke uh, where Ernest is, like, poking at a mummy in the bad guy's office. Yeah. And it's a it's a pretty good mummy prop that completely deteriorates after Ernest leaves. Yeah. And I think they must have realized that the the they made this prop look too good and the mummy looks really creepy when it falls apart because the mu the music they added to that shot is like a little bit too much. It's like We got we got to sand the edges yeah, off like of this. Yeah, like crying in the theater. We need to <laughs> <laughs> There's some good humor in this movie, but it's a little. It's, it's like three different types of humor. Yeah. Um, there's a gag where um, Ernest and Melon can't get past a certain roadblock, and there's a sign that says, um, oh, there's an apple maggot infestation. And Ernest goes, stopped by apple maggots again. It did not happen earlier in the movie. No, that's a good Never uh, heard that's a good, before. Yeah. That's a joke that's a good you story. Uh, there was a there was one Ernest face that I hadn't seen him do in a previous movie. Usually he has like certain faces. It's like a vocabulary reviews. of Jim Varney faces. Uh, when um, the, the doctor's new car gets demolished and he's like really Neat. freaking out, Ernest just says, Me. And then he makes this ridiculous face <laughs> and they hold on it for like 10 seconds. I made a note about that too. That's I thought that really was really funny. That was really funny. <laughs> Ryan, I mean, we, we, we're just dogging on this. Like, do, is there any light at the end of the tunnel for you with Ernest Rides Again? Uh, yes, for a couple of things. Number one, it ends. And we get <laughs> other Ernest films after this. So they clearly <laughs> learn some of their lessons. Yes, yes. There is a future past this, which brings me to, I watched the film on Amazon Prime. And you guys also watch on Amazon, yeah. I believe. Yeah. So we, watched the, we all watched the same version. And at the end of the film, there is a James Bond-esque Ernest shall return in. Ernest goes to school, and it's a whole lot of fun, and, and here's my locker, and, and a football team, and cafeteria food, and burn, they actually let me handle some real... And then there's a title card for Ernest goes to school, mm -hmm. coming to theaters near you, summer of 1994. It's a vote of confidence in themselves. Yeah. That... Does not happen. It did not happen. We will get to that whenever the wheel lands on Ernest Goes to School. Mm -hmm. That yep. also played into the padding I was talking about earlier. Yep, that's some padding there. I think they they must have known that this movie's just not gonna gonna resonate with people. It was almost like a promise. Like, don't worry, we're going back to basics. Look, here's like a Vern style first person wide angle lens Ernest short. And he like, it's a John movie. He goes to school. Yeah, it's funny because he's a grown up and he's dumb. I wonder uh, if they even written it when they shot that, or if, or if they're just new, like, yeah, we can put Ernest in a school, we can get a movie out of that, let's just call it that, we're gonna trademark it right now, and we're gonna start, we have our game plan, we had our group huddle, and we have our five-year plan for Ernest movies. When it comes to what works here, is that Jim Varney, although they put far too much weight on his shoulders to carry the whole movie, it's, we're still funny, Jim Varney's still funny, Ernest is funny, just Shoot the can let the camera roll, and he will save the movie. And that tragically doesn't happen. And that's just not a good plan. He's still able to, even in this dumb crap context, be the likable Ernest. That we still want to see Ernest get out of this jam, even if the context of the jam is bad. To be a bucket of cold water here, you know the previous movies aren't exactly Hamlet. Like you know, like no. the stories aren't great. But the character of Ernest was usually more or less pretty solid, including Barney's performance as well as the actual characterization. And, yeah, the yeah. characterization, the writing itself. Like we talked about why Ernest Goes to Camp is actually a pretty decent start for the Ernest character. Why Ernest Scared Stupid is actually a great Ernest story. In this, they are pulling him in several directions. Ernest is his maturity and his, his intelligence and like his interests and in just the, the character is just so... All over the place. And Varney does what he can to kind of make it feel like it's an organic person. But like Ernest starts like, you know, there's a scene where they're talking about scooching and hopping on the uh, the cannon when it's yep. going to fall over a cliff. It's actually pretty funny. Mm -hmm. oh, don't worry, I'm scooching. I'm scooching. You're scooching and looking. I was not looking. I'm scooching. You were scooching and looking and that counts as a hop. Says who? Says gravity. But Ernest is the straight man in that scene. He's like a different dude. Yeah. And a, a lot of this comes down to the the Dr. Mellon chemistry and that that actor seems fine. The character isn't like the worst character, but... If you're going to bet the farm on, we're going to introduce another character who will be Ernest's equal. Like, okay, well, what's his character? Okay, well, he's a professor at the school. He's like an archaeologist, a historian, and he's got a nagging wife, and he's kind of a Rick Moranis wannabe, and he turns into Elvis. 
<laughs> Twice, sort of. three yeah, times. Yeah. He does a little bit of a voice. I'm sorry, that's just not enough. That's not gonna hold. That's yeah. not like you can't. That's well, not your buddy cop movie with Ernest. It doesn't work that way. Here's the thing: they keep trying to in these movies, trying to figure out who's the who's the right foil for Ernest. They figured it out. Did yep. they? Yeah, it's Eartha, Eartha Kit. <laughs> yeah, but well, he and Eartha Kit have scenes together, but they don't really. What well, they they never really do much together outside of her shack in that in that movie. I think in Ernest Saves Christmas, he's got a uh, Harmony, who we don't really like as a character, but she does work because she's not a annoying little kid like in Scared Stupid. She's just kind of a generic watching Ernest do his thing. She's a cynic. Yeah, she's a cynic, and he wins her over, and that's kind of what works about that movie. You know, I will say there's a lot of strength to Lloyd back in jail because Lloyd was already a tough silent guy that mm -hmm. just was there. To, he w It would be weird for him to be as energetic or talkative. He's supposed to be big and scary, at, but at a cartoon level. Yeah. And Ernest does all the talking. Sure. Yeah. Well, that's what I was going to say is they had already figured out who the perfect foil for Ernest is, and that's Vern. And you can't make a movie around Vern because that would just be, that would be like hardcore Henry. You I, know? Think they, <laughs> I think they thought they were doing that with this. Yeah. I think they thought they were like crossing that bridge like, okay, here's what Vern is like. Yeah. And he's but just, yeah. But Vern is what see. makes the Ernest commercials feel like SNL shorts or something. Yeah. It gives a little bit of a bite because he's looking straight at the camera and he's being really annoying and it's like the joke is being played on the audience. Whereas Dr. Mellon in this is just too goofy to be the straight man. Yes. If you're going to personify the straight man in these Ernest movies. Yeah. I, I think if, I mean, obviously they weren't going to bring back Eartha Kid. No. But the reason Eartha works is, number one, she's fantastic. She's just too entertaining she, not she, to like. And movie. she, like Varney, knows how to play to the lens. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, so this is kind of like a crazy, like, serial commercial. This is where the camera is. Okay, yeah. I've got this. And, oh, and, it's and, shit. You buy that uh, old lady Hackmore in Scared Stupid wouldn't really be bothered by how dumb Ernest is. Like, I mean, she does like chastise him when he fails because he's stupid, mm -hmm. but she's not like creeped out by him or like, oh, let's not hang out with Ernest. Yeah. Whereas Abner Mellon is just, it's more writing than performance. I think the, the Elvis stuff doesn't come off like a uh, character progression or character growth. It just feels like, oh, now he's doing it too. Mm hmm. Yeah. So we're six episodes into Ernest Roulette now, and we've decided to bring our audience into the show by virtue of using our guaranteed video Patreon. You can join our Patreon and put even just a dollar in and we'll take your questions in the subsequent episodes of Ernest Roulette. How many more movies are there? Five? Four, actually. Four more movies after this. Maybe. So, so Ryan's got some questions from people. What do you got, Ryan? Well, let's check this tablet that's been here the whole time. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and from a gentleman named Mark Hughes. Thank you, Mark. Mark asked from home, quote, any plans to tackle the Hey Vern, it's Ernest TV show. Emmy award winning. Wow. That's right, it was. Yeah. No real plans. I feel like that's maybe a lot of the, the like the the bulk of the Ernest content, we we want to leave to the other Ernest podcasts out there, right? Yeah, yeah, which is the importance of seeing Ernest mm -hmm. and Ernest goes to podcast. Is there like a third one too? Ernest Roulette. <laughs> the <laughs> only Ernest podcast. <laughs> I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we just wanted to focus on the cinematic entries the really. features yeah yeah the spirit it's of the fair. show is to rank the feature earnest films mm -hmm. so and even dr otto is kind of skirting that line i just really wanted to talk about that movie yeah, that, yeah, was, yeah. that was my idea to put that yeah. in as our first episode our next question comes from bo jack and bo jack asks if jim varney had lived to make one more earnest movie what would your dream theme or holiday for it be hmm this is the question, right? Sure. If you could do an earnest movie, what would it be? This what would the is next, great. What would the next movie be? There, uh, Jim Varney was going to do some pirate-themed movie close to when he passed That's away. That's disputed. It wasn't an earnest movie. It was just right. Jim Varney was going to be in a pirate film. Yeah, which they made. And Yeah. Yeah. Um, I liked the idea of an earnest pirate film because I've seen Jim Varney do pirate voices. Yeah. yeah. And it, that would have been a great opportunity for Jim to play like a Blackbeard-type opposite himself. Mm -hmm. Like if Jim played more than one character. Oh, that could be fun. That was the first thing that popped in my head. Ernest's missing dog would be a great movie. Yeah. I think it would probably pluck at the heartstrings more effectively. Would it be Rimshot? Or or Rimshot, yeah. Right, good. Get yeah. A, we need a third Rimshot movie. Yeah, a movie where Ernest is trying to find Rimshot. Rimshot's going on some adventure. It would. I wouldn't want it to be too deep into the 90s because I think animal movies got 
pretty shitty as the nineties went on. You want a pre Homeward Bound? Pre Homeward Bound. No, well, t- Homeward Bound's like ninety three. It's early, but it's the first talking big talking animal movie. What's the dog that couldn't play basketball but then totally did? Airbud. Airbud. Pre Airbuds. Air uh, Airbud is probably the tone you'd end up with. Yeah, plus Ernest. You know, yeah, it's fair. Yeah, well, like Rimshot would be doing stuff, but I, yeah, I think uh, just Ernest's love for his dog is is too unexplored in these movies. Yeah, when we were watching Ernest Rides Again, I thought, you know, that they wanted a fake road trip movie. Yeah. They should have had Ernest and his dog driving cross country. Yeah. Um, what about you, Ryan? What's your dream Ernest vehicle? Ernest the Heretic, where <laughs> Ernest accidentally uh, replaces or d- damages some sacred religious text As through, will. like, some really tone-deaf fake version of, like, it wouldn't be as conspicuous as the Pope. It would be, like, some knockoff version of the head of the Greek Orthodox or Roman Orthodox Church or something, and and Ernest accidentally causes some huge desecration. It's all a big misunderstanding. He ends up going to the Wailing Wall. It's, like, he just does everything <laughs> wrong. He tries to, like, bridge everyone together and just can't stop. It's like Sasha Baron Cohen, but without all the malice. Ernest is really trying to save like religion <laughs> he's trying to bring the world together yeah and uh, but honestly what but he would, keeps doing shitty accents and offending all he, these he can't he has a new character and it's whatever you're thinking but worse <laughs> Ernest it, the heretic Ernest the heretic that just the title is amazing <laughs> the Ernest the, yeah it, uh, but honestly what would actually like get butts in the seats in the theater <laughs> is uh, Ernest with aliens Ernest, Ernest gets abducted by aliens. He gets some dumb power. Instead of electricity, he glows green. He can like do his blah, 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 blah. No, he can like, fi- you know, he could finally meet the spaced invaders. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so do. Ernest spaced out, or is that too slam dunk Ernest? What would the title be? Uh, Ernest abducted. We got that Rocket Man movie. That's kind of close, right? <laughs> Next question. With Harlan <laughs> Ellison, what's his name? With Harvard Williams. Yeah. Kit Spindler asked us, if you went back in time and directed an Ernest movie, what would the title be? Same question. I think by this they mean if we could have made one of the pre-existing Ernest films. If oh. we got to, you know, run the show. If we were sent back in time and tasked with making an Ernest movie, I think we would try and not to, try not to upset the timeline too much. <laughs> so <laughs> We've seen it, Primer. Yeah, so we would try to make a movie that fits in and does not challenge what an earnest movie is. We so make that dog that we make the dog movie. Yeah, you think the dog movie. I think movie we made the yeah. dog movie. And I think right in there. Yeah, and I think we wouldn't try to change any of the other movies too much. Sure. Next question from Bella. Just Bella. Bella asked, "Do you guys know of any bootleg earnests, perhaps other countries versions of him and try and get money on the concept too or just straight up imitations of him in the US?" Now, that would be an interesting site. Well, Bella, as a matter of fact, we found one. <laughs> we found one. Kevin nope. did some research. Yeah, because fir- my first thought when I hear this question, oh, are there knockoffs of Ernest? You think, oh, maybe like Yahoo Sirius or Crocodile Dundee, but they're not really the same thing. No. Yeah. I found a guy uh-huh. that is like one to one a ripoff of Ernest. What was his name? His name is Floyd Furter. Yes, sir. He ain't nothing to compare with chicken treats, real chicken hot dog. Like Frankfurter. He sells hot dogs. Is he also Australian? Because you just mentioned two Australians. I think he's Australian as well. But yeah. he's doing a southern accent. Yeah. But he's from so- uh, Australian commercials. They did, they did a bunch of these commercials for some hot dog thing at a fast food <laughs> restaurant. There's like a ton of them. I just love hot chicken and dogs. And in the words of that great philosopher of our time, Gladys Knight and the Pips, if loving them is wrong, I don't want to be right. Uh-uh, no way. I got the taste. That's as far as my research went. I put Ernest knockoff into Google. <laughs> there you go. You but mean they, him? They, That's exactly what You could mean. argue Thank Larry you. the Cable Guy. Many people have argued that, in fact. Well, just because he wears, like, redneck clothes. Yeah, but I think um, once he made the transition to film... They were probably thinking of Ernest you, and but, trying to trying to adapt the Ernest model to his okay. sense of humor. Well, are, I've never seen one of them. Are there Larry the Cable Guy movies? Like it's Larry the Cable Guy hanging out with Santa Claus, or is he? Yeah, playing I a think guy. He like well, even he does, does like the Tooth Fairy. Yeah, things, he does a Tooth Fairy movie. It, yeah, they hit the reset button on all of those movies. He has. I don't know if he has inventions, but he's got like shitty houses with like crazy stuff in them. And oh, really? Yeah. Oh, then that's totally earnest. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But but for yeah, but, but he sucks. Yeah, he sucks, yeah. and he makes like it's yeah. He's more racist and yeah, <laughs> yeah, more hurtful. More yeah. Yeah, he has malice. That we yeah. discussed how, in spite of Jim Varney's shortcomings and that things that history has either reflected well on or not. Yeah. Jim Varney has never had malice in his execution. No. Yeah, he's not making anything. like ass and. 
fart jokes in his movies so much. Or like making fun of culture. Ernest Goes to Africa is on our wheel. We don't want to. Yeah, we'll see how far. We'll see how bad that gets. Yeah. So that's it for the patron questions. Every two weeks, the three of us get together to spin the wheel to figure out which Ernest movie we're going to watch. And then we rank that movie right here at Jurassic Sound and Light. Mm -hmm. We hit a bit of a speed bump with the Ernest Scared Stupid episode wherein we spent literally an hour trying to rank the movies and we failed. So we had to have a bit of a committee, a team huddle and figure out what the hell are we doing when we talk about these movies and we try to give them a ranking. Mm -hmm. We try to give them like, what's, what is the rubric? A big part of the problem was we all have different favorite movies. We all have different rankings. So I came up with a system where we all maintain personal lists of, you know, the, the top movie and the bottom movie. And uh, then we take, each of our top movies, we give 10 points per person, so uh, if we all liked the movie the most, it would get 30 points maximum, and uh, we subtract a point for each rung of the ladder. That's the system we'll be using going forth. So as of the end of episode 5 of Ernest Roulette, our official ranking, based off this map, mm -hmm. was, at the very bottom, Ernest Goes to Camp, followed by Dr. Otto and the Riddle of the Gloom Beam. Ernest Saves Christmas? Mm-hmm. And then tied for first. Yes, with 27 points each. Ernest goes to jail, and Ernest scared stupid. Gentlemen, let's introduce the new player in episode six. Is Ernest Rides Again better than Ernest Goes to Camp? No. No. All right, there you have it. Join us next time where we spin the wheel to determine which Ernest film we watch and then rank amongst the entire world filmography. If you know what I mean. <laughs>